Tomorrow we officially turn the page from summer to autumn. Once again, it's time to welcome back our resident astronomer, Dr. Chris Palma, who is Associate Dean for Undergraduate <laughs> Students in the Eberly College of Science and a member of the Penn State Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. It's really nice to have you back in the studio, Chris. Thank you. So what's fresh on my mind is that four civilians just spent three days orbiting the yeah. Earth, came back on, uh, over the weekend. What goes through your mind as you, as you see this new era of spaceflight? Yeah. I, I always tell people human spaceflight and astronomy, we have different goals, right? They, they want to get people to Mars. We want to study Mars and learn how it formed. But those um, space flights are inspirational. I have students all the time who tell me, I saw a rocket launch on TV and that's why I want to be an astronomer. So I think there's nothing but inspiration and fun that can come out of those, uh, those human space flights. And you mentioned the idea of a manned flight to Mars. Mm -hmm. I mean, this keeps getting floated. But there are so many unmanned probes, mm -hmm. both on and orbiting Mars right now, including one that helped create the first detailed map Yes. Of the inside? I mean, is the inside of Mars, is it like the inside of Earth? Yes and no, <laughs> as the answer always is. Um, I love, there's a quote about that that I love. It took us hundreds of years to figure out what the inside of Earth was like. It only took us two years uh, <laughs> to figure out what the inside of Mars was like because we can apply everything we learned about how to measure the inside of Earth to Mars. And we've learned that the core is a little bit bigger. Um, the crust might be a, a little bit smaller, but we now have a map of the inside of Mars from Mars quakes. So I think that is an amazing result. And, you know, speaking of planets, seems like there's always a new discovery involving these so-called exoplanets, yes. the ones orbiting other stars. Now, I guess a disk has been detected around an exoplanet that might tell us something about how moons form? Yes, yeah. So I always uh, bring up Jupiter in this, right? Jupiter has these huge moons, and we assume that when Jupiter formed, there was a disk of material around it that formed those large moons. Now we've actually discovered one of those disks in another system. So that tells us that our ideas for how planets and now moons form are actually on the right track. And so we do think that that planet may end up with large icy moons like, like Jupiter's. And I, I mean, just sort of as a follow-up to that, Telescopes have the ability to see this. Yes, that's extraordinary to yeah. me. And and I, I mean, yes, and it's and it is a challenging observation to make, which is why it took us until 21, 2021 to do it. But yeah, we, today we can actually observe planets and moons in the process of forming. That's remarkable. Um, on the subject of other habitable planets, you you tell me there's this mm -hmm. paradox mm -hmm. in your yeah. field that has to do with how our sun is actually not the most common type of star, yeah. yet it has a habitable planet around it. What's the thinking there? Yeah. Well, what we want to know is, is Earth alone? Are we rare? Like, is, is Earth really the only kind of planet that can have life, or is life common? So our sun is a yellow star. The most common star in the Milky Way and in the universe are red small stars. So people say, well, if life can form anywhere, it's much more likely for life to have started around a red dwarf star. So why are we around a yellow dwarf? So either life isn't able to form around red dwarf stars, or we are um, an outlier. Like we are, you know, a, a little bit of a fluke. And so that's what we have to solve. That's why it's a paradox. We don't quite yet understand how does life form around other planets? And so by studying what types of stars planets might form around, that's gonna help us resolve how did life form on Earth in the first place. And I guess you call this the red sky yeah. paradox. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, looking a little more closely at what's going on in your department, I noticed that over the summer, mm -hmm. Davy Lab, mm -hmm. which houses <laughs> your department, Got a bit of a facelift, a new yeah, dome. Yeah. I mean, give us give us the inside scoop on yeah. that. This is so near and dear to my heart because it's something that I've really been pushing for for years. Um, we are really fortunate to have some great facilities here at Penn State, uh, but our telescopes on the roof of Davy Lab uh, dated back to the 1970s when that building was built. So we just a few years ago put a new large telescope on the roof, and it needed a new dome to keep it safe from the elements and, and to uh, enable us to, to observe with it. 
So that telescope is a research grade telescope. It lets our students get hands-on um, practice with a world-class telescope here in State College before they go to Hawaii or Chile and get their hands on the million dollar class telescopes. So it, it was a great upgrade uh, to our observatory here and really is a fantastic resource for the students. You're gonna make it harder for us to steal your good astronomy <laughs> students and convince them to be <laughs> meteorology majors. Yes, yeah. So why don't we close with a sky watching tip or two yeah. for folks. Uh, if only we meteorologists can get the sky clear. Yes, so, so we've talked you can actually see another galaxy from your backyard. So if you go outside and you can find what we call the Great Square of Pegasus, which will be in the eastern sky at, at this time of year, right after um, dusk, connected to the Great Square of Pegasus is another constellation called Andromeda. And in the Andromeda constellation, there's a faint fuzzy. It's, it's almost impossible to see by eye just alone, but even with a small pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you can resolve this faint fuzzy object into a ball of light. And if you're able to do that, which will take some practice and patience, which I always tell people to be careful about, you are seeing light from two million light years away. So the light reaching your eye from the Andromeda galaxy left two million years ago before it arrived here at Earth. You know, I remember from my youth watching a movie called The Andromeda Strain. Yes. And yeah. so we're here we are talking about the Andromeda galaxy. Dr. Chris Palma from the Penn State Department of uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics, always great to have you. Thanks. And we will be back in a moment with more.